Uh, so, like a lot of other uh, countries, uh, Australia, Canada began uh, building public housing in the post-war period, really to really to begin to house returning vets. So, in Canada, partnerships between the federal and provincial governments uh, resulted in the creation of about uh, 200,000 public housing units between the period after the war until about the early 70s. But unlike Australia, in the, in the early 70s, Canada made the switch to community-based housing. And so at that time, federal and provincial governments partnered with community-based agencies to create, to create social housing. And so the sector has really been around in a, in, a, in a pretty substantial form for the last 50 years. Why the switch was made largely was because of the public backlash against public housing, some of the larger public housing developments, especially in cities like Toronto, really led to the emergence of the community-based sector. And so federal and provincial governments supported those community-based sectors to create, to create um, social housing. Uh, since the early 70s, about 460,000 uh, um, uh, community-based units were created. So the, so, the, so the proportion is a little bit uh, different between the two countries. Of the 660,000 social housing units in Canada, 460,000 are owned and managed by nonprofits. Um, what was interesting last week in Sydney, a lot of discussion around um, the role of the uh, role of the federal and provincial governments with respect to the provision of housing. That debate happened in Canada in the early uh, 90s, really driven by austerity measures in the federal government. The federal government offered the provinces the opportunity to take on sole responsibility for, for social and non-profit housing, and, and that happened across the country. So today you have a situation where you have a federal government housing agency largely just responsible for the provision of mortgage loan insurance and each of the provinces responsible for the setting of housing policy and the delivery of programs within their jurisdiction. In British Columbia, uh, that agency is BC Housing and so this wheel talks about the, uh, the different components of, of that housing. Uh, so the public housing is, is something that BC Housing owns and manages. There's about 7,000 units of that housing. Uh, the community-based housing sector manages about 60,000 units, and we deal with 800 nonprofits across the province. So a large, a large number of nonprofits. Many manage only one building, but we have a few, um, uh, you know, more sophisticated entrepreneurial nonprofits. I'll talk a little bit about um, their role. Um, uh, rent assistance in the private market: about 50,000 units targeted to families, seniors, and um, more recently to homeless folks. So those are housing allowance programs. People rent in the private market, and government helps bridge the gap between what the landlord charges and what um, tenants can afford to pay. Uh, uh, we also administer the homeless programs, uh, the shelter system, and uh, supported housing units. Again, done in partnership with nonprofits. One of the most important, um, one of the most important um, elements in the delivery of our programs is um, financing. And I'll talk a little bit about that and related to some of the some of the programs and projects later. Is um, we manage a mortgage portfolio of three billion dollars, and so we make financing available to nonprofits both to construct new housing, so construction financing, but also arrange for long-term takeout financing. Because um, BC is a AAA credit, uh, international credit rating, uh, just to give you some sense of, of rates, uh, construction financing provided at about 1.1, 1.2%, takeout loans, 10 year money on a 35 year amortization around 2.6%. So the combination of very low construction financing and takeout financing become very, very powerful tools when you're partnering with nonprofits and local governments to create, uh, to create that housing. We still build about 1,500 new units a year uh, in partnership with nonprofits. Um, so, I don't have my I, that slide there talks about last year, uh, 1,300 new units, uh, 40 projects in 20 communities. So, still a lot of development occurs. BC Housing is also responsible for uh, licensing builders in the province as well, on the private side. <coughs> Uh, just to give you some sense of the, um, the, the comparisons between the, the two countries, number of households, and um, uh, just talking about some of the average housing costs, um, I, I noticed the, um, the British Columbia average and the Metro Vancouver average are actually, um, are actually flipped. Uh, and uh, what I really wanted to show is a really strong comparisons between the two countries, uh, especially the split between um, uh, ownership housing around 68, 69 uh, percent, 
uh, rent rental housing um, 20, 25, 26, and social housing in the 4 to 6 percent range. Costs are very similar as well, too. Vancouver, uh, BC, open economy, a lot of foreign investment driving up the cost of housing. So you can see the average housing costs are very similar between, between the two countries. So some of the similar, same type of housing challenges. So now I, I just wanted to touch on some of the um, specific initiatives that we've put in place in British Columbia and, and the whole uh, asset transfer of public housing to the nonprofit sector is a topical issue that's happening in the states across Australia as well. So last year we uh, launched a nonprofit asset transfer program and that's really looking at provincial housing assets and transferring those to the community based housing sector. Uh, with the goals to strengthen the, that sector, uh, allow the sector to lever those assets. So when you transfer the assets and the value of those assets to the sectors, to create those opportunities for the sector to use those to um, lever new housing developments uh, and um, maintain the existing housing, and to really support the transformation of the sector. Like, uh, like in Australia, you, we have challenges around um, access to uh, senior levels of government funding, uh, the age of the housing stock, and, and this really is a belief that transferring those assets and the power uh, to use those assets to the nonprofit sector is the way to go. Um, and, and that's based on a policy that, that uh, the community-based sector are better stewards and managers of the housing than, uh, than the um, provincial government is. Uh, just a little bit about the mechanics of the transfer. The land is transferred at fair market value. The nonprofit uh, receives um, uh, assistance in arranging uh, mortgages. We provide, BC Housing will provide the nonprofit with a subsidy so that they're able to pay the mortgage that allowed them to purchase, to purchase the land. And then one of the big benefits from the asset transfer is actually the cash that comes in to BC Housing, half a billion dollars, will be reinvested back into the sector to create other housing opportunities. And so from that perspective, it's a win-win ownership of the asset transferred to the sector, cash comes in and is reinvested back into other forms of housing. Uh, I just wanted to talk um, uh, uh, about a couple of the first public housing sites to go out. Uh, that's um, the peninsula in Vancouver. For those of you who know Vancouver, the, the dark green piece is, um, is um, uh, Stanley Park and uh, you know, highlighting those, those two, pieces of, uh, two pieces of property. The first one is Nicholson Towers. It's in the Vancouver's West End, about 226 units. The one I really wanted to focus on though, just to give you some sense of the scale of the transfer, is um, Stamps Place. Stamps Place is a 370 unit development on almost 10 acres of land in the heart of Vancouver's Strathcona neighborhood. Age of the building is 47 years. Transfer price based on the social housing value is $65 million. And so that's what the nonprofit will pay BC Housing once we arrange the financing for them. So the 65 million comes into us, gets reprofiled back out into other forms of housing. The market value of that site, though, is well in excess of 115 million dollars. So when that transfer occurs, there's actually a transfer between the transfer price and the value of the site of almost 50 million dollars that gets uh, transferred to the nonprofit side of the ledger. And with, uh, with, uh, with the knowledge that the nonprofit will be able to lever that equity over the longer term to create other forms of housing. Um, and you see the, the monthly mortgage payment is um, $242,000. So the financial mechanics of that will be we would provide a subsidy to the nonprofit so they're able to make that ongoing um, uh, uh, mortgage payment. wanted to um, uh, move on and just talk a little bit about the importance of financing. Um, so uh, a number of years ago we launched a community partnership initiative and um, this works with, um, with uh, local governments, with nonprofit and private sector to create those opportunities in light of fiscal challenges to, uh, to create other forms of housing. And so I talked a, a lot about the financing package and I just wanted to, um, uh, I'll move on to a, a specific example of how a community partnership initiative works in the context of a land trust model in the city of Vancouver. So this is a 358-unit um, uh, four-site development. Um, the, the community land trust, the city of Vancouver will lease four parcels of land 
to the Community Land Trust under a 99-year lease for a dollar. The Community Land Trust will work with four nonprofit community-based providers to create 358 units of, uh, of housing on four different sites. I wanted to talk about, um, and so how does the City of Vancouver make those sites available? Three out of the four sites were actually a result of their inclusionary zoning policy, so it's a major redevelopment of some land down by the river. And the inclusionary zoning policy requires that 20% of land in a major rezoning, major rezoning a site more than two acres, has to be provided for social housing purposes. And so th that land made available to the City of Vancouver, City of Vancouver then makes it available under a long-term lease to, uh, to, a non to non-profits. The fourth site was actually acquired by, by the City of Vancouver through an outright purchase. From about um, the early 2000s in British Columbia, the expectation when we build social housing is that local governments provide the land for free. And, and that's become part of the understood partnership with local governments as part of a collective responsibility to address the issue. Local governments provide the land for free, the provincial government comes in with um, capital and operating financing to allow those developments to be created. Just to give you some sense of the scale of this development, uh, 358 units on four sites, total project cost 120 million, and you can see the various pieces of um, equity and uh, contributions that are needed to make a development like that work. In the old days, government would have come in with 100% capital and operating funding to make those work. In, in light of the new environment, you're looking for more entrepreneurial ways to de develop that housing, and so you see the different layers of financing. The nonprofit groups actually contribute equity of almost $4 million. Uh, one of the sites has a commercial retail unit uh, that provides some uh, funding to make the development work. The New Market Fund is an interesting piece. We're beginning to see the social venture funds be, uh, come into vogue in, or, you know, in their infancy in Canada. And so this social venture fund will provide $11 million in uh, debt equity to, make the, to help make the project work. Uh, I talked about um, uh, uh, um, cash from our asset sales. We will invest some of that in equity, and so you see there's $4 million in equity there. Lease up income, and then what really helps to make the project work is the, both the debt financing, the long-term debt financing of uh, almost $70 million, and we will provide construction financing to the, to the project of, of, of uh, more than $90 million. And again, that financing provided at 1.25%. So it's really the glue that helps make those kinds of um, those kinds of projects work. Um, a, a little bit about uh, the continued role of the federal government. Um, the federal government uh, still helps to cost share some of our affordable housing programs in Canada. Uh, funding of about 30 million dollars a year, cost matched by the provincial government. Uh, so. If, Pretty meager, pretty meager investments by the federal government, but they still help, and you can look to different opportunities to invest those equities into different, um, different projects. I just wanted to finish up by, uh, by just, um, you know, with the kind of challenges that, uh, that we face with respect to funding, looking for different ways to, uh, to, 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 to let, leave our opportunity. This is an interesting one, our single room occupancy hotel on the downtown east side was actually done through a P3, it was the first P3 social housing project in North America, uh, renovating 13 of our old hotels through, uh, through a P3 model, $143 million, and it included some funding from the federal government. We have a conservative federal government, really um, an advocate of P3, so provided an opportunity to, uh, to refurbish some of those hotels. And so, uh, j just leaving with a message around, uh, there are challenges around fiscal environments. We have a great system of nonprofits, great partnerships with local governments, and, and there are and continue to be opportunities for those partnerships to, to work and to uh, continue to create uh, various forms of affordable housing. Thank you. So what we're going to do is the three presentations and then go to questions, just a, a brief, um, uh, moment of station identification. Uh, we have uh, a hashtag, if you're tweeting, transforming housing, one word. Um, the two PowerPoint uh, presentations are going to be available on the transforming housing website next week. Just Google transforming housing and you'll get to our website. 
So obviously finance and policy are essential to provide affordable housing, but it's also really important to have a strong community housing sector, and our next speaker, Janice Abbott's going to be talking about strengthening the community housing sector. Over to you, Janice. Thank you. I'm dying to do shadow puppets or something here. <laughs> got our, all our heads up here. It's very uh, odd from feel it behind you. So um, I work for an organization called the Tier Women's Resource Society. Um, we're actually a group of about five different, well, not about, we are a group of five different entities that's headed by Tier Women's Resource Society. Um, Shane's giving you a bit of perspective about the provincial environment. Um, clearly his perspective uh, as, a, as a government, a representative government is a little bit different than my perspective as a community housing organizer. So. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how, how that's different. So, uh, Atira, um, this is one of our buildings in the downtown east side. Atira was formed in 1982 as a nonprofit organization. We're primarily um, at our lead, a women's anti violence organization. Um, and we operate a number of women and children only buildings across the lower mainland of Vancouver. So, these are some of the, the housing. We do a lot of supported housing, a lot of specialized housing. Um, we're focused uh, uh, um, in the last number of years on an aging population, so many of the women we house are growing older, so we have specialized programs for women over the age of 50. Um, we also have a focus on providing uh, support and housing to women in an effort to keep women and children together. Um, in the downtown east side, we house probably about, uh, the downtown east side being the inner city of Vancouver and the poorest postal code in Canada, um, we house uh, women who are who's extremely mar marginalized so struggling with um, substance use, struggling with mental and spiritual wellness, um, poverty obviously. Uh, many of the women we house are uh, doing street level or survival sex work, um, and most of them grew up in the foster care system, something like 80 or 85 percent of the women we house. And, and uh, further to that, they have children who have been apprehended. So again, one of our primary goals is to keep women and kids together in an effort hopefully to prevent that sort of intergenerational cycle. Um, we operate a number of non-residential programs, everything from legal advocacy to 16 step groups, which is a feminist alternative to AA and NA. We are guided by three um, very specific principles. We are feminist identified, we operate within an anti-oppression framework, um, and we utilize harm reduction principles in all of our work. Um, so we do have a, a number of programs in the downtown east side of Vancouver. Have, has anybody heard of the downtown east side? Is it any awareness of that? So a few folks have. So the downtown east side is a very, um, it's a difficult neighbor, neighborhood, although it's under intense pressure right now to gentrify. So we're working with advocates to make sure that through gentrification, um, the folks who have made that community home for uh, decades will not be displaced. Um, I can't, I wish I had glasses or something. <laughs> um, so that's sort of the, the downtown east side. It's a very interesting neighborhood, the Strathcona neighborhood where Stamps Place, as it Shane mentioned, um, it has really gentrified over the last couple of decades and there's now homes that sell their heritage homes and they've been restored and sell in that neighborhood for in excess of two and a half million dollars. Um, and right across the street at Oppenheimer Park is where we had our most recent tent city. So it's a group of probably over 100 folks who camped there because they had nowhere else to live. So it's a really interesting um, uh, interesting and challenging community in that way. One of the things that I like to remind people about the downtown east side is despite, all, despite its history, despite all of the challenges in the downtown east side, um, and many of you may not know that part of its history includes the disappearance and murder of more than 100 women by a serial killer um, who was caught in around 2002. So it's got this very challenging um, uh, and, you know, uh, just to point out, most of those women who were um, disappeared and murdered were indigenous women and were women who were involved in survival sex work. So um, despite all of that, it's also a community where many people feel like they belong. Um, people support each other. There's many people who live in the downtown east side who would not feel comfortable in any other part of Vancouver. So it's got this sort of um, horrific history and also this um, amazing sense of community and support that folks feel down there. Um, downtown East Side is the home of Canada's only safe injection site. Um, this is despite our current federal government, which has fought tirelessly to have this site closed down. And um, uh, probably about a year and a half ago, lost a Supreme Court decision that enabled it to remain open, but has uh, created legislation in the meantime to ensure that none will open elsewhere in Canada. Um, the safe injection site does save lives. 
Um, it saves lives, it prevents the spread of infectious diseases, it prevents overdose. Uh, um, we have a real problem in the last couple of years in Vancouver with a synthetic opioid called fentanyl, which is causing a lot of deaths um, across the lower mainland. So this is a place you can go and um, have a, a nurse practitioner, doctor, get primary health care and supervise your injection and have people watch you and be with you while you're using. Um, Shane already talked about the P3 project, so this is one of the Gastown Hotel. Um, when I first, or when Interior first started managing that hotel in about 2009, it probably hadn't had anything done to it in about 40 years. Um, it was a, a 92 room, uh, I think they're called rooming houses in Australia, in Vancouver we call them single room occupancy. Um, no communal kitchen, so people uh, living there who um, were struggling with poverty had no cooking facilities, no laundry facilities. Um, when I walked into the uh, commercial space the first time I was in the hotel, there was literally a sea of rats undulating across the commercial space floor. So um, last summer it reopened. It's still a single room occupancy hotel, so there's still bathrooms that are shared. Um, but there's also a large communal space, there's now a communal kitchen, there's laundry facilities, um, and it's been uh, amazingly restored, so it's a, a much different space and um, very welcomed by the tenants who live there. It also happens to be in Gastown, which is a very trendy area. It's part, Gastown is another part of the downtown east side, it's a very trendy commercial area in Vancouver. Um, in 2002, we set up um, a property management company. Uh, in 2002, the primary goal, I mean, this, sorry, this is a list of um, other social enterprises in the downtown east side. Um, so in 2002, we set up a property management company. The primary goal when we set it up was to earn profits that would be donated back to the Tierra Women's Resource Society to help support its not-for-profit activities. Um, it is a wholly owned, for-profit subsidiary of the Tierra Women's Resource Society. Uh, you can see there some of the um, some of the numbers. We return about hundred thousand dollars a year to Tier Women's Resource Society. Um, we also have relationships with vendors, so our donations have increased because we we tender a lot of work, a lot of maintenance work in the property management industry, and those vendors make donations to Tier Women's. Um, but the biggest, I think, uh, benefit of the property management company over 13 years is that we're able to borrow against the equity in the company to build new social housing. So we've leveraged the property management company up to its eyeballs. Um, so, I to do it this way. So um, our portfolio includes about 80 strata corporations, which are condominiums. We also have a portfolio of non-market. We manage um, buildings, non-market buildings for other uh, non-profits, mostly single, non-profits that have single buildings. Um, we managed uh, 20 single room occupancy hotels. And one of the things that's happened over the 13 years is um, when we began to manage single room occupancy hotels, we made a decision to hire folks from community. So we employ about 280, that number is a bit old, um, people who live in the single room occupancy hotels to work in the single occupancy hotels. They're entry-level positions, they're primarily security positions. We work in partnership with an employment agency that provides training. We pay a living wage. Um, there's a pension plan that folks have. Um, they have extended health and dental benefits. Um, and, they, and they work. And many of these folks haven't worked in decades. Um, they have histories of struggles with substance use. They um, continue to struggle with mental and spiritual wellness. Uh, and we've had to create a human resources department that, um, that's able to respond to those struggles because they want to work and we want to keep them employed. Um, about 61% of our staff are Aboriginal or of Aboriginal ancestry, and I want to be really clear that that's the result of a, a, about a 21-year human resource uh, strategy. That's not an accident. So in the mid-90s, we made a decision that we wanted to better reflect the folks that we were housing. Um, in our staffing group, and we made a number of significant changes to our hiring and recruitment policies in over 20 years. This is, uh, this is how far we've gotten. Um, we speak about 40 languages across our staff, and we have about 500 staff in total, um, including five Indigenous languages, which is um, amazing because Indigenous languages are disappearing in Canada and North America, much like they are around the world. Um, in 2013, and I'd really encourage everyone if they get a chance to read this report, we commissioned Ernst & Young to do a social return on investment report for us. Um, Bart Goosehead, who you see there, is one of our employees um, in the property management company. Um, we looked at a number of things when we did the, uh, the, the SROI. Um, everything from really uh, stuff that was really simple math, so the fact that people were on income assistance or welfare when they started working, and the fact that they're now um, receiving a wage. 
and, um, and paying taxes, so that kind of simple math, um, as well as in using a, 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 a wealth of proxy information around things like um, a reduction in the uh, interactions with the criminal justice system, with the healthcare system, and what that um, what benefit that was to taxpayers in the community. And then we looked at stuff that was a bit more difficult to, to, um, to uh, um, get robust information on, but we still included it. Things like the folks that people who live in a, a disadvantaged community now have spending money, they have pocket money. So what does it mean to the community when they're able to spend money in the community? So buy groceries, go out for lunch, get their haircuts. So we actually tried to measure that as well. Um, Ernst and Young did a fabulous job, and if you get a chance, um, I encourage you to read it. Um, we have a develop. Oh, sorry, this just talks about how we grew the property management company to get the breadth, breadth um, and depth that we needed to grow organically. So we did five acquisitions in the first ten years that we operated. We went out and bought smaller property management companies, and we did that because we have a robust social enterprise, or we were able to do it because we have a robust social enterprise. Um, community or sector in Vancouver and BC, and we were able to borrow from some of the um, some investors who had, a, a, including a local credit union, who have an investment or a, a, a have made a priority funding supporting social enterprises. Um, we have a development arm. We set up the development arm primarily to protect the Tierra Women's Resource Society from any risk in the in the development that we're doing. Uh, this is our first project. It started construction in June of this year. It's a 198-unit project in the downtown east side of Vancouver. Um, it's a mixed-income project, so how it all kind of hangs together is, uh, is that the market rental that will be in this building will help subsidize the cost of operating the non-market. It's 52 units of housing that will end, or sorry, rent a welfare, maximum shelter allowance for folks on welfare. Um, and they will rent to women-headed partners, so there'll be women-headed leases. We have a real struggle in our other programs when women um, enter relationships with male partners. When those relationships go sour, it's typically the woman who ends up homeless again, so this is a response to that. The woman will be on the lease if the relationship ends, she will, end up, will remain housed. 68 units that rent at something called housing income limit rates, which means their junior and studio bedroom units, uh, sorry, ju judio, ju studio and junior one bedroom units, um, and they'll rent at 30% uh, of uh, a tenant's gross annual income, and they can earn more than $36,000 a year to be able to live in those units, and then 78 that rent at market rental units. It's a partnership with a local developer um, called Cressy. They're contributing their construction management fees. Um, which is about a million dollars to the project. Um, BC Housing is purchasing 52 units at a cost of 8.3 million, so that will be air parceled out and BC Housing will own those units. We've raised another about four million dollars through a variety of philanthropic and, um, uh, and other sources. Um, the City of Vancouver enabled us to do this project by granting us some extra height and density on that site. Uh, which helped to make it pencil out. They also provided a grant in the amount of $1.2 million. So it's a, a, a whole bunch of um, uh, sources of income and work that enabled this project to uh, come together. And it will be finished in about 18 months. Um, we have another for-profit sub, which is a painting company. It's, uh, it was, it's primarily an employment program. The goal is to provide women who we house with living wage jobs. In Vancouver, uh, when you go through uh, Red Seal or an apprenticeship program, you can earn up to about $38 an hour as a painter in the construction industry. So that's the sole purpose of that. We're not opposed to earning profits, but that's not the goal of that company. Um, and we have an arts society, which I won't go into because I'm running out of time. This is our container housing project. It was completed in 2013, um, made from entirely from recycled shipping containers. Um, we have a second project underway. There's a report on our website, which is also an easy read. It goes through both the process of building it. There's a cost analysis, um, also well written. Um, our second one, which you can see there on the big picture. Sorry, this is sorry. This is the one that we've already built. The one that you saw before was our new one, um, and it'll be eight stories tall. So it'll be the tallest recycled shipping container structure in the world, and we're quite excited about doing that. Uh, I won't say that these are cheaper to build than other kinds of housing. We've only done one. The first one definitely was, um, but you can't talk about cost definitively when you've only done one project. So we need to do a few more to, to determine definitively whether it's a less expensive way to build housing. Um, I must be out of time. This is a payload approach unit that we set up. It's specifically for women in the inner city. It's the first women, believe it or not, the first women-only payload of care unit in the world. 
um, which we were shocked to discover. Um, and we're working with women in the inner city, so uh, the kinds of illnesses that we see are, are COPD, HIV and AIDS, um, and many women get better um, and are able to move on to other kinds of housing where they can continue to get the health care they need. Um, and other pro uh, partnerships we've done with developers are to lease um, single room occupancy hotels, developers buy properties in the downtown east side. Um, there are restrictions on, uh, uh, legal restrictions the city of Vancouver has set up on tearing down or removing um, rooming, uh, rooming houses from the affordable housing stock. So many developers end up with rooming houses they don't want to operate. Um, we manage a handful of those. Uh, and then finally I'll talk about um, par uh, another partnership we've done, we've done in the city of Richmond, which is a suburb that's sort of adjacent to Vancouver. Um, and it's a partnership with five other nonprofits. And how we've made this work is um, by bringing together equity those five nonprofits have to build a 172 unit building. The partnership was encouraged by the city of Richmond, and the city of Richmond has also brought a lot to the project in terms of community amenity agreements, and our, our contributions rather, and land. Um, and BC Housing is also involved in this project. So I'll end there because I've run out of time. Thank you. So two things. The first is that this brings us to the end of our PowerPoint presentations and the lighting on the speakers is actually quite Guantanamo Bay uh, um, uh, style interrogation. So I'm kind of hoping that we can turn off the projector for our third speaker and turn up the lights if that's possible. Uh, we'll see. Yeah, okay. Now we just need that projector light open uh, off before it actually literally blinds me. Okay. Um, so, we've heard about uh, innovation in policy and financing. We've heard about innovation in uh, community housing provision and um, associated social enterprise. Transforming housing is about building more affordable housing, but it's also about building better affordable housing and the importance of well-designed affordable housing that's near jobs and services, or as one of our members called it, Quimby quality in our backyard is really, really important and we have the capacity to deliver that in uh, a town like Melbourne with a lot of really amazing designers. So for inspiration, we're going to turn to our third speaker, Natalie DeVries, who's going to talk about some of the design contribution to affordable housing. Over to you, Natalie. <laughs> Thank you. Yes, I, I don't have a PowerPoint uh, with me because tonight I will be giving a lecture and there's an exhibition, right, so next <coughs> year, uh, of uh, a lot of our work, uh, and especially the housing in detail. Um, and as I was listening to uh, the stories, I, I realized I'm also here as the architect, but maybe also as urban designer. Um, and I can tell you, uh, because as a young architect in the Netherlands, a lot of young architects were getting involved in housing, especially in affordable housing. So it was almost like a bit of a deliberate uh, policy of the affordable housing associations that we have. Um, uh, they've been in place, I think, already since the beginning of the 20th century, when we had a housing law uh, that said, well, uh, uh, cheap houses should also have a good quality. Uh, even the law, uh, different measurements were described uh, that were protecting, let's say, the, the inhabitants. So there were certain minimums, uh, disc minimum description of what the quality of a house should be. And uh, yeah, at some moment, housing corporations were erected, and they are in, in the Netherlands uh, responsible for building affordable housing. Um, in the um, in the 80s and 90s, this was also about the time that my office uh, started. Um, it was also the, 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 the uh, idea that it was not so good that all these affordable houses were just in one uh, place and put together as one cluster or uh, a whole part of the town was just affordable housing. So the idea, because people also realized that uh, uh, people make sometimes a career in living, uh, so it's one thing to protect the people uh, that cannot afford uh, housing by uh, often subsidized places. But on the other hand, sometimes people yeah, make promotion, uh, people get uh, better uh, jobs, uh, and um, a lot of the mid-income people were uh, moving out of the cities uh, to the suburbs, uh, to the not affordable housing, partly. And um, 
So the, the thought was why not try to also give more attention to people with mid income and mix, uh, mix the different income groups uh, more. Uh, and on the other hand, if, uh, if mid income housing is uh, built, why not uh, make sure there's also a certain portion of affordable housing always uh, in, that, uh, in that development, also in the suburbs. Uh, so at some point, uh, most of the developments had uh, always like a 20% rule. It's interesting to hear this 20%. Uh, that either in the neighborhood, in the urban plan, or even in buildings, uh, one of the examples is on the wall, around 20% of the housing uh, would be dedicated to affordable housing. And uh, the idea is to make a more mixed population. So, uh, and it's interesting that it, it works both ways. So, <laughs> Not only in, uh, in, uh, in, in new developments affordable housing was put in, but also vice versa in areas that had predominantly uh, affordable housing and low income housing, uh, deliberately uh, a little bit more mid income housing has been uh, built. Because uh, the idea was people want to stay in a certain neighborhood, and it's not just about the price of the house, why they want to live somewhere, but it's also yeah, they want to be in a certain place. Um, and uh, so, interestingly enough, in our, in our projects throughout the times, we have been dealing with all these aspects. Uh, so either you would be making uh, one building in which a part of the uh, houses would be affordable housing, but all in one structure. And of course, it's true that the, the more expensive housing for a part subsidizes uh, the building of the affordable uh, housing. There was always, of course, the idea, would you then be able to notice that would these houses have different entrances, for example, or would you have a different facade? And would you see the facade uh, change suddenly? It would be a bit more cheap. Same design, a bit cheaper. Um, yeah, that's where, I guess, also the younger architects came in, and they found more creative solutions over yeah, changing typology, the type of house, rather than just a facade or an extra couple of square meters. Uh, so it, it became an interesting design task uh, for architects to make different typology, different types of houses, rather than being totally focused on whether they were uh, a couple of square meters uh, bigger or, or smaller, or cheaper or more expensive. In fact, uh, at some point, the quality of the affordable housing, I think, became even better than, uh, than of the developer uh, that... Uh, uh, buildings. Um, so, like I said, uh, maybe it's 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 a very uh, yeah Dutch approach. Uh, and in Scandinavian countries have that as well. This sort of idea of leveling out. Uh, but in any case, the, the idea was if people of different income and background, but also social background, even elderly people, young people, uh, live together uh, in a, in a certain mix, that's better. And it's a, so it's a deliberate policy of of, uh, of the Dutch. Uh, cities and municipalities to create a mixed uh, society with, with mixed incomes. Uh, yeah, so it could also be that you have a street and then one side is affordable housing and the other is, uh, is, is, is mid-income housing or higher. We make neighborhoods in which very expensive villas and affordable housing are, are mixed as well. Um, so yeah, the, the design question I will talk about it tonight, but you can maybe also recognize it sometimes on the plans, is what is exactly then the difference between these houses, apart from, uh, from the price. And uh, yeah, maybe it is for, for a designer, for an architect, for a planner, there is not so much different, probably. It's just different types of houses that you are building. And if you approach it in that way, uh, yeah, I guess a lot of people won't be even able to recognize uh, the differences between, uh, between the one or the other type. Except that it might be more difficult to get into one uh, than into the other, if you're not on the waiting list of the affordable housing. Um, so that's an important aspect, I think. Um, in the Netherlands in the, in the, in the 80s, uh, the, the housing corporations also were allowed to develop much more, so then they started to develop neighborhoods. They would also buy old buildings and convert them into hotels, and I don't know. So except from building maybe also schools and 
uh, libraries or daycare centers, they were allowed ever more development. Uh, but very recently, that part of our uh, housing corporation task has been uh, reduced again because it turned out that, yeah, it is done, of course, with public money. And the corporations started to behave themselves a little bit like developers, but without the risks that a real developer uh, would have. So that, unfortunately, because of a couple of scandals, uh, the, the tasks of the housing corporations have been made much stricter um, again. Uh, and, uh, uh, but for, the, uh, for most part, I would say that a lot of the developments in the Netherlands you see, uh, especially when there's a larger amount of houses being built, you will see public-private partnerships. So you will see housing corporations and developers working together in one urban scheme, or one will be developing for the other. Uh, um, uh, yeah, or incorporate uh, mid-income housing in, uh, in the affordable project or vice versa. Uh, a developer will incorporate in their urban scheme places for uh, a corporation and they will be making appointments about, yeah, they will share, uh, they will share the design task, you could say. So we would have like two clients in a consortium uh, telling us uh, what kind of design uh, to make. Yeah, about the special groups, I was, I was thinking about that as well. Um, that's maybe also uh, something uh, interesting to tell in the Netherlands. Um, I think uh, we have come to a point where a lot of the special type buildings are, are being taken away. So everything we do uh, in, the, in the design of houses is aimed at that people stay, have their own house and they take care of themselves in their own house. So that means that even if you get older or disabled, you can stay living in your house. So that means something, of course, for accessibility and floor plans. Uh, and it means also that uh, the care you will be getting will be coming to your house. So there will be a nurse. If you're older, there will be a nurse coming to your house and helping to take care of you. So I think most people are treated more like an individual that sort of buys, uh, yeah. Uh, the help, and the helper will come to your house. Or if there's a problem with a child, the child will go to a foster family rather than to uh, an institution. And this is a, one of the most recent developments, you could say. And that's all aimed at that you are like an individual person and you get help financially and, and by organizations, but you sort of almost buy, you get budgets, they call budgets, to buy the help uh, that you need, so special places for women only, you know, with single women with children. There are famous architectural examples of that also in the Netherlands, designed by an architect called Aldo van Eyck, for example. But these places are, are closed now, so the whole thought about everybody stays in the community, also if you're handicapped or older, uh, that is also part of our design task, so that means that Sometimes you get a uh, special design task for groups or for, 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 for special groups, but it's always part of a bigger development. So it's never just an individual um, solution. So that's maybe in short what I can tell about, uh, about the Dutch uh, affordable housing system. Thank you. Yeah. We've had a super knowledgeable uh, uh, panel, but we've also had a super polite panel who stayed to time. And that's important because I look out at the audience and I see researchers, people working in finance and policy, people working in government, people working in community housing, and people working in the design fields. Now we have about 20 minutes for a question period. I believe there's going to be, yep, we have a, moving, uh, a roving mic that Jasmine is going to be roving with. Um, are there questions for our panel? And if there are, could you please direct it to one speaker or all of the speakers? So I see a uh, hand up in the front. Jackie, we'll start off with you. Jackie Fustaki, I'm from local government, City of Yarra, from the councillors. Uh, my question is to Janice. Uh, I wasn't clear on the 14 story East Hastings Street ex example where it was a mixed uh, development with, I think you said, 78 market rental and then 
uh, doubles that the others. Uh, that was all rental accommodation, I assume, and I, I actually would like to get the comment from Natalie because whether that's all rental accommodation, what happens here is we we do affordable housing and sell. It's only affordable for for the first uh, time because once it enters into the private market and the demand in particularly in inner areas means it's never going to be affordable. So I wonder how that, you know, is there a deliberate policy on that in both those areas? And secondly, um, when we've done a, a, a affordable housing uh, units, or, you know, that we've, they've been attempt to mix, but it's been in a separate building rather than the salt and pepper uh, arrangement. So I'm just if you could uh, tell us about how that's worked. Because the developers say that uh, in that they need, need to have it in a separate building to get their economic return to provide the proper subsidy? Um, sure. So, uh, Fort Monty East Hastings is a, a, a unique building in Vancouver um, to date. Um, that's not to say that there aren't examples of mixed income buildings in other jurisdictions that have um, fared uh, really well. We have a number of um, uh, very specific situations in Vancouver that I think will make this project work. One is we have a vacancy rate of less than 1.5%. So we're building uh, rental housing that's desperately needed by everybody who lives in Vancouver. Um, we, uh, I was very clear, and this has been a question not asked not just by you, but certainly by our bankers, because we're not borrowing from BC Housing in this case, we're borrowing from our local credit union. Um, who believe that the, the way that we've set the building up is going to be difficult to rent to market renters. Um, we aren't going to have, as I said, or maybe I didn't have spoken a few times, but we're not going to have airspace par parcels where we have poor people on, um, you know, three floors and middle income people. We're actually scattering the 52 units throughout the building and the 68 units, so people won't know whether they're living across the hall from someone who's paying market rent or paying welfare rent. Um, we have um, uh, ele three elevators in the building, and those three elevators will be accessible to everybody, and they'll go to all floors. Um, and it is a bit of a social experiment um, in Vancouver, but it has been done successfully in many other jurisdictions in the world. And there's a researcher in Vancouver at the University of BC called Sir Somerville, I think, um, who has done a lot of research on this. So it's, this is not um, isolated in that way. Um, there's a whole bunch of things that make it work um, that I didn't get into in gory detail, but for example, um, the building will be rental housing in perpetuity. Um, we've signed a housing agreement with the City of Vancouver in exchange for sizing, or signing that housing agreement, which I believe is a 60-year agreement. The city provided a grant of $1.2 million. They um, exempted us from DCLs and DCCs, which are development cost levies and development cost charges. So that's about another $1.2 million in contribution. Um, uh, and we, um, and, and as I say, we're required to have um, non-market housing in, per in perpetuity for the life of the building. Um, we do have the option, as the mortgage is paid down, to change the unit mix. We could do more because the building will throw off a lot of revenue eventually. We've got a, which is a bit of a crystal ball, but a 30-year cash flow um, that shows uh, that this building will be very profitable over time. We can either take those profits and use it to build more non-market housing or we can increase the number of non-market units in that building, whichever um, is going to work best. Um, so yeah, it is a bit of an experiment in Vancouver, but it's not, uh, it's not the only building of its kind in the world. There's very successful examples of this in other jurisdictions. And just briefly, Natalie, in uh, the Netherlands, when you um, provide affordable housing, is affordable housing for rent, for ownership, and if it's for ownership, how do you keep the affordability? Yeah. Uh, well, it's, it's mostly for rent, um, but sometimes uh, after many years, people can buy the house as well themselves uh, for a low uh, for low price. Uh, I must tell that there's also uh, something that's called the, the tenants protection law. That means that the that the rents cannot rise above certain percentages. For, for affordable housing, that's a, it's a low fixed percent, percentage. But also for higher uh, market uh, rents, uh, there's a fixed, uh, a fixed percentage. They cannot rise for more than a couple of percent per annum. That's another important component. Does anyone else have uh, another question for our panel? Yes, in the front row. Hi, Michael Levy from the Australian Financial Review. Question for Shane about you said last year you started an asset transfer program. How did you how does that address the reluctance of 
the public owners of these assets to move them off their balance sheet um, and, and adjust for, the, for the, the loss in value, the hit that they would be taking by giving these assets to um, another, you know, a, a, another legal entity. Sure. So, so I, didn't, I didn't get into the, into the actual detailed mechanics. I, I talked about the public housing sites. There are also 350 other sites that we own but we leased to nonprofits. So all of those sites will be, will be transferred too. In total, it's about a $2 billion transfer. But th those assets were always held on the government books at its book value. They were never written up over time to a highest and best use value. So they were always at, um, they're always at a book value. So when you sell them at a market value based on the current use, there's actually a gain on sale in an accounting sense for, for the government. And so it's actually a positive hit to the government's balance sheet when these assets are, are sold at a higher value than they're currently being carried uh, on their books at a book value. And so from that perspective, you had housing policy lined up with treasury policy because treasury policy, you know, always anxious to balance budgets. BC is the only province in Canada with a balanced budget, um, looking at how the asset sales can help contribute to that. We were happy to piggyback onto that fiscal policy in order to achieve a lot of our housing objectives to strengthen the sector and get the assets into the hands of nonprofits. Okay, we have time for about two more questions before the combination of noise and cold drives us out of here. I see Roz in the back has her hand up, so if you can move to the back. Rose Hanson. Um, we're currently having a discussion about inclusionary zoning in the city, um, and there is uh, some nervousness perhaps within the developer, the private developer sector. I was wondering from the BC housing perspective and others, the Netherlands experience, how do you actually sell this concept to the private sector, and what has been the response since the 20% has been in place in terms of uh, those plays in the housing market? Just before you answer, Shane, I should say that Roz has chaired the Ministerial Advisory Committee on um, the Metropolitan Plan, so she's very invested in this. <laughs> so the 20% policy in, in Vancouver has been, around that battle ha ha has been fought, but because they become, uh, they, they become uh, negotiated settlements with developers when you're looking at the overall development of a particular parcel, all of the, all of the factors around cost Get, get built in because a lot of times there are trade-offs around um, height and density that get made when you're looking at a greater than a two-acre site. We were at, um, Carol and I were at the Minas uh, Metropolitan Planning Authority yesterday and some hesitancy around um, inclusionary zoning, uh, density bonuses and extracting some value from those density bonuses that you're going to drive up the cost of those individual units. And that's just nonsense because what happens is you have such a large market that, that all of that noise around a particular project gets um, filtered out through through the general market. So the developers are, are, are going to have to come to terms with those kinds of negotiations. And they just become a public policy pieces around vibrant markets like Melbourne, Sydney, and Vancouver can absolutely take advantage of of the uh, of the development pressures to translate those into some extractions around social good, and and um, it, it is a well understood part of the negotiation in Vancouver. Um, the developers have come to accept it, and those negotiations um, uh, happen uh, on 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 sites all the time, both on up zoning and on larger sites where the twenty percent applies. I'll just say something to that too. So we've just come through a local area planning process in the downtown east side of Vancouver. So it's a district called. Uh, De um, downtown east side Oppenheimer uh, Park zone um, and that uh, inclusionary zoning has been lifted from 20% to 60% in the last couple of years so in the downtown east side district right now developers any rezoning um, developers are required to build 60% social housing 20% has to be at, um, has to rent a uh, housing not housing um, maximum shelter allowance so 3 375 a month um, and the other 40% has to rent at something below market um, there was a bit of resistance, I think, um, but uh, two years, the one with the plan adopted about two years ago. So about two years ago, people got on board with that plan. It was a plan that was developed in consultation with the community. Um, there certainly was some disagreement, but that plan was adopted. So in the downtown east side, the requirement is not 20, it's 60% um, non-market housing in each new rezoning. And, and, and quite interestingly enough, 
within that small zone in, in the downtown east side, market condos or for sale apartments aren't even permitted. You can't, yeah, you can't, you can't, build, you can't build for sale. So the city of Vancouver has really looked at how you begin to preserve and socially, you know, provide for social inclusion. What it's also done is it's also downtown land values in the downtown east side. So it's helped ensure that the downtown east side will remain a community that's um, available to folks that are low income folks. Just before we take a brief follow-up question, I'd be interested as to uh, the Dutch situation, Natalie, and whether developers uh, call the shots to the extent that they do in Melbourne. <laughs> call the shot. I think developers all over the world have uh, issues with reputations. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I think, I think a lot of the things uh, that I hear from Vancouver, it's a, it's a matter of negotiation. And it, once cities and municipalities have a certain policy, and they stick to that, um, yeah, it's, it has to be negotiated. And of course, there are trade-offs and, and all these elements in it as well. I mean, nobody wants to not give developers their, their, their profit or, or anything. Uh, it's also uh, uh, something social. I mean, I, I was recently involved in the conversion of. Uh, I'm involved in the conversion of offices in housing. And actually, interestingly enough, there are now enough family houses, this is in Amsterdam, but they want to make more uh, small houses now. And, and one of the first questions of the, of the, of the people, because the developer organized a community meeting, was will there also be affordable housing? And then the developer said, yeah, we discussed this with the municipality, but in this area, uh, yeah, uh, we are going to be just a little bit above uh, the affordable housing level, so we all agreed in this area this is not necessary. But the community itself is even actively taking care of that and discussing it. And yeah, there will be huge opposition if if uh, yeah, if this balance is uh, is broken in a, in a certain way. I think we have a brief burning follow-up question, uh, and then we'll move to the next person. So I assume that the rezoning process is the trigger for actually introducing. Okay, we have a zoning system here which is not necessarily, unless it would be from industrial to residential or industrial commercial to mixed use, that would actually enable us to do that. Much of our residential zone land, it continues to be zoned residential. So there might be limited scope to use the zoning trigger to actually introduce the requirement in terms of inclusion or zoning. Do you have any thoughts on that? It's just, it makes it a bit difficult under our zoning regime to completely do it, other than on uh, non-residential sites. Um, are, are there, so typically in a rezoning, there's some relaxations that are needed around parking, height, setbacks, those sorts of things. Uh, uh, sometimes the uh, city of Vancouver uses any type of approval as as um, it, its way into a negotiation around the community. Same, same with more. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So we're going to move to the next question. You can ask more afterwards. Um, do we have one? I think we can take one more question uh, if there is one from the uh, audience. Right. Once. Going twice, we have one more question from the front. Very vocal folks at the front here. Yeah, this is uh, first to, to Natalie. Uh, I'm interested to understand, given that in, in the Netherlands, uh, housing associations have been around for quite a long time, uh, the degree currently, almost uh, I guess as a percentage between the development of housing that's done through housing corporations versus the, re the amount that's done through more uh, straight commercial developers and what the balance is. Because certainly in Australia, there's a huge uh, imbalance between what's done commercially and what's provided through the commercial development market versus housing association. I'm curious what it's like in, in the Netherlands currently. And it, it, are there been major shifts in, say, the last 10 or 15 years? Well, the, the interesting thing in the Netherlands, I think, is that we believe that there is enough affordable housing, but because the protection of the tenants is so strong that people are allowed to stay living in them, even if they don't really need it anymore. But since the rent is so low, 
Okay? You might not get a subsidy because your income is too high, but nobody can get you out of your house once you're in. So our problem is now to convince people to move out of the very cheap houses that are sometimes in fantastic locations in the inner city of Amsterdam to, let's say, a mid-income house so that their house becomes available again for affordable, uh, for people who really need, uh, yeah, with a low income who really need that house. So we have more like a, yeah, that, that problem, it's called living, uh, <laughs> not straight living. <laughs> yeah. So living in a house that is too cheap for your income. So to speak. Yeah. yeah, that would be a problem that would be wonderful to have. Uh, yes. With that note, um, and given the temperature, I think that we would accept not only a strong round of applause, but perhaps some snapping of feet for three excellent speakers. Good. such an unusual hour. It was great to see this lovely turnout. Thank you.